Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein, director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center and associate professor of medicine and neurology. I'm so pleased to be with you today talking about an important subject of how IBM and PM differ. So with that, my topic today, polymyositis or PM and inclusion body myositis or IBM and how are they alike and how are they different? These are my disclosures. So in order to tackle this topic, we need to understand first the clinical differences between PM and IBM. In other words, how should a doctor be thinking about these things in the clinical standpoint of how you would present to us as a patient? Next, I'll take you through the world of neuromuscular pathology to look at the pathologic differences between polymyositis and inclusion body myositis. And it's not surprising that they can look very much alike, and that's why they're not only confused clinically, but also, also pathologically. We'll also look at the differences with regard to autoantibodies. An antibody is a protein, and an autoantibody is a protein directed against a self protein, which is abnormal and unusual. Generally, antibodies protect us, but when antibodies are attacking our own proteins, thinking, erroneously that it's protecting us, that's a pathological state, but it does help us discern the differences between all of the types of myocytes. So first I'll take you through inflammatory myopathy subtypes and the way that we classify them. And please be clear that your clinician is probably not sitting with a checklist thinking about this, but we do think about the way that you tell us about your story and how you are affected by your symptoms and try to characterize it a little closer. Most of the classification criteria that you'll see are really made for research purposes, for clinical trials, but they can help a clinician decide as well, but we generally don't do this in such a formal manner. But I want you to see the way that we think about these diseases uh, in a very methodical fashion. So the first thing to tell you is that myositis is a general term. Myo means muscle, I itis means inflammation. Any itis is an inflammation of something. And myositis is an inflammation of the muscle. Strictly speaking, myositis is not always autoimmune, and it's a general term of any injury to the muscle that causes inflammation. So you could have a viral myositis, and that's not what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about the autoimmune version of myositis. And there are many, and they're on the slide, and this is a long list that even many doctors probably don't think a whole lot about. Some of them are very rare, especially as we get lower down on the slide. So today we're charged to think about polymyositis and inclusion body myositis. There's a bit of a relative newcomer on the slide, it's the fourth one down, called INMN, which is Immune-Mediated Necrotizing Myopathy, or NAM, Necrotizing Autoimmune Myopathy. And we'll talk about that as it's a close cousin to what we would call polymyositis, but it's different under the microscope. So polymyositis and inclusion body myositis, let's talk about those. First, we'll talk about the 40-year-old diagnostic criteria called the Bowen and Peter criteria. These are criteria that doctors still hold on to today, despite the fact that we now have updated criteria, which I'll also show you. Again, I'll remind you that these criteria are used in a research fashion, but it certainly does help us check off the boxes as we're trying to hone in on a diagnosis for you as well. They consist of the following. Symmetric weakness, elevated muscle enzymes, EMG abnormalities, changes on muscle biopsy, and a rash. Because we're not talking about dermatomyositis today, we'll take the rash out of this. And the more of the first four criteria that we have, it was thought that the more definitive it would be that you had polymyositis. So how did we diagnose definite polymyositis in the past? Well, we said you had to have symmetric proximal muscle weakness. Let's break that down. Symmetric means that it's the same on both sides. Proximal means shoulder and hip girdle more often than something distal or distant from the, um, from the truncal area. So usually it's our deltoid muscles and our hip flexors, along with sometimes biceps, triceps, and even our quadriceps. But the main muscles that are weakest usually are the deltoids and the hip flexors. 
elevated muscle enzymes. The most common is your CK or CPK. That's creatine kinase or creatine phosphokinase. It's both are the same. Aldolase, which is another muscle enzyme, which is not always checked as often. And quite frankly, even rheumatologists and neurologists don't always know exactly what to do with it, but sometimes isolated uh, aldolase can be elevated when your CK is not. Sometimes they both go up together, and sometimes only your CK goes up. When they both go up together, that's generally an indication that there's something abnormal in the muscle. Transaminases, or liver function tests, poorly named, uh, can come, of course, from the liver or the muscle. And so we don't usually like to call them LFTs, or liver function tests, but it wouldn't be unusual. I bet someone watching this talk got a liver biopsy because of these abnormalities before anyone thought about them coming from the muscle. That's an SGOT, an SGPT, or sometimes known as an AST and an ALT. And then LDH, which is lactate dehydrogenase, again, also comes from the liver, but also comes from the muscle. Myopathic EMG abnormalities. An EMG is an electromyogram. I'm sure if you're watching this, you probably have had an EMG before or you're scheduled for one. Uh, I've also experienced an EMG because I wanted to know what it felt like. And for those of you uh, somewhat worried, I would say that it's uncomfortable but not painful. And why do I say this? Well, they do put needles inside your muscles. The neurologist will put needles in specific muscles, trying to take a look at how it responds to that stimulus. Normal muscles have normal muscle characteristics when placed when a needle is placed in the muscle with a uh, and, and read through the machine. Abnormal muscles. Uh, have what's called an irritable signal or an irritable myopathy. That means that when that needle is placed in that muscle, it has a very characteristic look to the neurologist that is known as an irritable myopathy. If you are treated partially or and then come to see the doctor after maybe having been on prednisone or another immune suppressant for a while and you get an EMG, it's possible that you'll have what's called a non-irritable myopathy where we still see that there may have been irritability before or this is partially treated. So it's not a normal muscle, but it's not that typical irritable myopathy that we're looking for in that new diagnosis. Typical changes on muscle biopsy. This is generally an inflammatory process and I'll walk you through that with some pictures of exactly what we see under the microscope when we would look at your muscle biopsy. And then finally, um, the more criteria, as I said, you have, the more definitive the diagnosis. So four of the five, four of the five criteria, in other words, all four of the first four would be definite dermatomyositis. If you had one fewer than those, then it would be probable, and then only possible if you only had two, and that's where we're just much less precise, for sure. The newer classification criteria that were developed in concert with the American College of Rheumatology and our European colleagues in a um, um, as part of ULAR, these are the ULAR ACR or the ACR ULAR criteria. You even have a web calculator to help us calculate. I don't expect that your doctor is likely doing this calculation. Perhaps they are, but this is usually done for research purposes. But this gives us a probability score, and you can see that, in, in, which I'll show you in subsequent slides, the more probable we uh, are on our scoring, the more likely that you have one of our diseases and the myopathies that we're looking for. So we're actually looking for greater than or equal to 55% probable, and then we'll go on to subclassify you even closer, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. The first thing that you'll see on this slide is age of onset of first symptom. That means uh, if you are 18 or older, you're said to have the adult version of myositis. If you're younger, you are said to have juvenile myositis. I will say that juvenile polymyositis is a relatively rare entity. Juvenile dermatomyositis is more common. Juvenile necrotizing myopathy is probably more common than we realize, but not as common as JDM. If you, uh, and, and inclusion body myositis, as far as I know, is really not seen in childhood. There are in, uh, rare uh, familial types of inclusion body myositis that do present younger in age, but generally not as children. So it doesn't mean that when you hit the age of 19, you suddenly can't have the childhood version. And what does that mean? Well, there's a continuum. And so young adults in their 20s may look much more like kids that have myositis than adults. Kids generally don't get cancer, whereas adults may. Kids do not get IBM, and certainly adults may. So uh, it's not exactly um, a, a strict cutoff, but it helps us sort of 
classify you more likely to be in the childhood version or more likely to be in the adult version. Here we heard about symmetric weakness before in the proximal uh, muscles. This criteria separates it into upper and lower. So you get a little more points the more muscles that are involved. Neck flexors are also added in here, weaker than neck extensors. So neck flexor is a common muscle that is weak in the myositis syndrome. In the legs, if the proximal muscles are relatively weaker than the distal muscles, and we'll talk about what that means here, that usually suggests that we are not talking about IBM, where it has more distal muscles further from the trunk that are affected more. The next criteria have to do with rashes and papules and signs. These are the specific rashes over the knuckles, extensor surfaces, and eyelids that are part of dermatomyositis and not part of this talk today. Dysphagia, which means the inability to swallow either liquids or solids regularly or normally, or esophageal dysmotility, where you've had a study that shows that your swallowing isn't normal, whether or not you might even notice that. That helps us try to discern whether or not this is a true myositis. And while dysphagia may be more common in IBM, it certainly is seen in the polymyositis version as, of, of myositis as well. anti jo one JO actually stands for the um, initials, the first part of the name of the first person found to have this antibody way back when. Um, and if you have the JO1 antibody, this is not usually seen in IBM, can be seen in dermato or polymyositis, but it's much more appropriate to call that part of what's called the antisynthetase syndrome, which I'll show you in a moment. Elevated muscle enzymes we've already talked about, and here they talk very specifically about which ones, very similar to the Bohan and Peter criteria. And then the last four features on this screen show you the pathologic features from a muscle biopsy standpoint where we're looking for those vacuoles, typical of IBM, inflammation of lymphocytes, those white blood cells that sometimes look the same in IBM and PM, to be honest. And it might be the way that they surround those fibers, which might help us determine that it might be more typical of dermatomyositis. But of course, with dermatomyositis, you usually would have a rash in the areas we talked about. So once we figure out that you have these some of these criteria and you have a probability of 55% or more based on that little calculator I just showed you. Now we think about what those criteria look like based on whether you're younger or older. So on the right, this takes us down the juvenile pathway. In the middle, that says, do we have a rash? So if we're older and we have a rash, we go down the middle. If we have a rash and we're weak, we have dermatomyositis. If we have the typical rash and we're not weak, we have amyopathic dermatomyositis. And on the far left of that screen, and that's where we're going to concentrate because that's my job today to talk about the difference between PM and IBM, here's how we start making that difference. <clears throat> so if we've determined you don't have a rash on your eyelids, you don't have a rash over your knuckles or the extensor surfaces, you do, however, have some clinical features that may help us. So clinical features are muscle biopsy features that are helpful. So let's take you to the right of that screen. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. I can't recall if I'm recording, if you can see this. So <clears throat> the finger flexor weakness and if response to treatment says no go, you're not improved and you have finger flexor weakness <clears throat> or your muscle biopsy has rimmed vacuoles, both of those put you much more in the IBM category. If you have the absence of those, it may or may not speak to the fact that you have PM, but you surely almost certainly don't have, probably don't have IBM, you more likely have something in the other category, which is quote unquote PM. And I say quote unquote because I'm gonna challenge you that if you've been diagnosed with polymyositis, to think about whether your doctor has thought about and whether someone has ever mentioned to you a more appropriate diagnosis that might hone in a little bit. Sometimes we use that diagnosis as a waste basket diagnosis to say it's not IBM, it's not dermatomyositis, it's the other thing. And just to be clear, we want to make sure you haven't gotten the wrong diagnosis. And it might be a little bit more important to classify you a little closer uh, into something else other than this big diagnosis of PM. And you can see here in parentheses, immune mediated necrotizing myopathy, again, that big word. That's another type of non-rash-related inflammatory myositis that can be a mimicker to PM clinically. 
we'll, we'll, I'll show you what that means in a bit. Let's first start off with IBM and look at the clinical version of what that looks like. So by definition, IBM is usually seen in older individuals. By definition, it's usually over 30. Um, most often, though, over 50. And quite frankly, the vast majority of patients present in late 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe even their 80s. So this is really a diagnosis of middle age, and I would even say more skewed toward the elderly. You'll see the male to female ratio here is two to one. And that's important. That's very different than the other myositis syndromes that, like other autoimmune diseases, have a female predilection. So polymyositis and its cousins and dermatomyositis and immune media necrotizing myopathy seem to favor women three to one. So for every one man, we see three women with, those syndrome, with that syndrome. With uh, IBM, it's the opposite. It's about a two to one male to female. So I definitely, in my own experience, have more male patients with IBM, but certainly women can get it and we may be even missing it because we're thinking more often of that classic patient, that older gentleman who has IBM, but certainly women are not excluded. Like PM, proximal strength loss is included here, and that can include the deltoids or the hip flexors. Asymmetry is more often seen than true symmetry. So while proximal muscles are affected, more asymmetry is seen. And I would guarantee you almost always that asymmetry is seen where your non-dominant side. Usually people are right-footed, right-handed. What does right foot mean? It means if you go up the stairs, you're more likely to start with your right foot than your left foot. And uh, obviously your, your dominant hand is usually the one that you write with. So the vast majority of people in the, in the world do have a predilection for one side or another. Most of us are right side, but certainly we have our, our lefties as well. If you're left-handed, your left side is probably stronger. If you're right-handed, your right side is probably stronger. Muscle atrophy is more commonly seen here than the other myositis syndromes. And that atrophy has very specific places, like the quadricep muscle. Unlike polymyositis, the quadriceps are more uniquely targeted, even though they can be targeted in both. We see much more visible atrophy in the quadriceps. So those are the muscles in your thighs. And those muscles are responsible for elevating or extending your knee. If your knee extensors are weaker than your hip flexors, that's much more common um, pattern to be seen in IBM than the other myopathies, than PM, for example. And you also lose the forearm flexors. So you see there on that insert, the black and white picture there is of the scooping of the forearms. That's that scooping concavity that's found in later disease, but can be seen in, in the disease at any point in time. But that affects, that, that atrophy specifically sort of affects those muscles and then includes the finger flexors as well. So when I look at patients' arms, I'm always sort of trying to see that scooping. And the way that I look at that is looking, you really can look at your own arm if you're not affected by IBM or if you're wondering if you are. If it's concave um, versus, I'm sorry, if it's convex, it's much more likely to be normal than the concavity that you see here. Distal strength loss in the finger flexors is manifested sometimes by the inability to have a full grip. Your writing, your penmanship may change. You may have difficulty picking up keys or small objects. And a doctor will test that by looking at your finger flexors. I always say it's like a little monkey on a tree. Usually you'll see me in my own clinic. If you're one of my patients, you know this. And if you're one of the patients of the many people that I've trained and work with, you know this. We'll pull on you either this way, pulling those finger flexors, or trying to pry your fingers off my own. Grip alone isn't enough to really see this finger flexor loss because you can recruit other muscles in the hand and cheat and make it look like you're stronger than you are. So we try to isolate those finger flexors in particular. Looking at our EMG, now I told you that usually it's a myopathic EMG, an irritable myopathy, and it's true in IBM as well as PM. However, in IBM, we more often see neuropathic features, neuro meaning nerve. So not only is the muscle involved, the nerve can be involved in the way that we see that in the electrical stimulus that's given. Okay, so the neurologist will tell me it looks like a mixed myopathic neuropathic feature on the EMG, and that puts me usually more in the IBM category. And the muscle biopsy, I'll show you photos, 
there is a characteristic inclusion uh, on the, what's called a Grimori trichrome stain, a particular stain that's blue, and we're looking for this red rim vacuole of inclusions. That is classic, but not always seen. So only about one third of the time when we biopsy patients in the beginning of their illness do we see these inclusions. Sometimes we never see them. There are people that have had three biopsies, we can't find them. And that may be because they don't have them and we don't understand why, or it may be they do have them and they're sampling error, meaning that we just really didn't see the part of the muscle that had the inclusions, and that may be true. And then finally, just from a clinical standpoint, if you've been labeled as treatment-resistant polymyositis, and to be clear, many people get labeled erroneously, unfortunately, as treatment-resistant when they just really haven't had an adequate trial of therapy. So treatment resistance, or if you were responding and then don't respond or develop some of this distal weakness where you didn't have it before, you may either have IBM or transforming IBM, where I, again, this is a controversial subject, but many of us in the field do believe that there are people that look a whole lot like what we would call PM in the beginning. And then years later, sometimes months later, transform into looking more like IBM. I have several of my own patients who I have followed for decades that I am certain did not have an IBM phenotype, meaning they didn't look like IBM at entry, but looked like that more over time. There are data-driven criteria that one of my close colleagues and co-director of our center, Dr. Tom Lloyd and colleagues along um, with other neurologists have developed to say, if we have these three things, we can be 90% sensitive, 96% specific, meaning that if they're present or absent, both of those um, states help us try to be a little bit more precise in trying to figure out if IBM is there. So finger flexor or quadricep weakness, I've gone over this. If that's present, that's a checkbox there. Endomesial inflammation is the clinical term or the pathologic term for inflammation with lymphocytes among and in between the muscle cells. So I'll show you what that looks like. And then either invasion of non-necrotic, so non-dying muscle fibers or rim vacuoles. And those are three, there's two pathologic criteria, one clinical criteria taken together with the sum total of the disease where I'm seeing asymmetry and um, maybe it, it matters with regard to your age or your gender, putting this all together whether it's more likely to be IBM or PM. All right, I'm gonna make a radical statement here. I said it before, I've even debated it on a stage with my colleagues as part of an international uh, uh, group of myositis experts, that polymyositis is a rare disease. I was challenged to say it doesn't exist. Maybe it exists, but I think it's pretty rare and I'll tell you why. I think it probably exists, but it, it probably deserves to be more finely thought out and better named rather than throw everything into this category. What does polymyositis mean? Poly means many. Myo means muscle, itis means inflammation. So this is many muscles inflamed. Guess what? Many muscles can be inflamed with a lot of things. So polymyositis tends to be this big term that doesn't necessarily help us clinically, in my opinion. What happens when we look under the microscope? Many of you have undergone a muscle biopsy. And if you are um, suspected of having IBM or polymyositis, you almost certainly should have had a muscle biopsy or should have one. Making that diagnosis without a muscle biopsy is really um, not possible in my experience. You really do need a muscle biopsy if you are considering those entities. There are some exceptions with the right antibody and a good clinical story that we may not biopsy you, but usually the biopsy is, is needed. On the left of the slide where it says normal muscle, here we see a normal muscle fascicle. So this is like one part of the muscle Fascicles are individual muscle bundles, and this is one of those bundles. And you see that the shape and size is relatively uniform. The purple cells on the perimeter are actually the nucleus of the cell, and instead of inside the cell, like you'll remember from biology class like a million years ago, usually the nucleus is in the cell. On muscle cells, they're on the perimeter. If they go inside the cell, the muscles are a little angry, and usually that's a myopathic or an abnormal muscle biopsy. On the right, this is um, an example of what polymyositis might look like. This is primary inflammation. It means that you have normal fibers. Their size and shape is variable here, so it's not a normal muscle biopsy. There's internalization of some of those peripheral nuclei. And then around those cells, you see those little purple cells. Those aren't the nucleus of the muscle cell. Those are lymphocytes. They are generally lymphocytes. There are white blood cells that come in to come to an area that they think they're helpful. They have been called to attack 
and get rid of the foreign invader, although there is no foreign invader that we're aware of, it is your, it's self-attacking self. Dermatomyositis is on the lower screen there, and we're not gonna talk about that today. But polymyositis can look exactly, or IBM can look exactly like polymyositis if we don't see those red rim vacuoles, and I'll show you an example in a minute. But what we also need to think about is that relative newcomer, it's not so new, it was first really elucidated in around 2003, but it's taken almost 20 years to catch on where people realize there is a difference between polymyositis and this. This doesn't have those typical lymphocytes. There are, and there's another kind of cell called a macrophage that is present but mostly there is regeneration, degeneration, and necrosis. Cells are dying and regenerating. So this is really not this. This is not polymyositis as the way that we have called it in the past. It may look clinically identical. It doesn't look like that under the microscope. So that's why a biopsy is very helpful. Antibodies are also helpful, and I'll talk about those in a bit. Inclusion body myositis can look on one stain like the left, that's your polymyositis mimic. Look right, looks exactly the same. If we're lucky enough, we do a specific stain and we see those red rim vacuoles there. So they have a redness to them, a red rim, and they are classic, but they are not always seen. When they are seen, they help us. When they're not seen, if we're really confused diagnostically, it doesn't mean you don't have IBM. That's when we're looking closer for those finger flexor weakness, those quadricep, that quadricep weakness, that scooping, that asymmetry, all of those things trying to be uh, precise if we can't really nail it on the pathology. So I told you that polymyositis is a rare disease, so what, what else is PM if it's not polymyositis? Well, as I just told you, it can be IBM. It can be IBM that was misdiagnosed, or it can be IBM that comes with time. Again, this idea that polymyositis transforms into IBM over time, I think is catching on a little more, and I don't think we fully understand that phenotype. That, that when I say phenotype, that's the, we don't understand exactly the person that manifests that, what that exactly looks like, or what causes that. Immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, or NAM, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, I think I've given you several examples, and we've talked a lot about that mouthful of a diagnosis. What about overlap? Now, maybe you're saying, Dr. Christopher, I think that this is the same thing. Aren't we just calling this polymyositis with something else? Well, yes, but I think you need to know with what else. And why do I say that? If you are having polymyositis travel along with another rheumatologic diagnosis like scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's or lupus, I need to know that because I want to know what other characteristics I should look for. For example, well, where? Lupus and polymyositis, if they travel together, I'll be careful to look at your kidneys. Most of the time, kidneys are not involved, but you have lupus, it may be. Rheumatoid arthritis is often the initial diagnosis and polymyositis follows, but then I'm also going to be thinking about something called the antisynthetase syndrome and making sure that your diagnosis is correct, and I'll show you why in a minute. And most importantly, scleroderma, which typically means, literally means hard skin, sclero meaning hard, derma meaning skin, Scleroderma is another autoimmune disease that we see in concert with myositis, but we frequently don't see that hard skin. It can be very subtle, usually only on the fingers, but what we do see is Raynaud's phenomenon, this blue or white color changes in the cold or with stress. We see maybe those little red dots across the chest or the cheeks, which are called telangiectasias. And those can be subtle clues for us that we need to be careful to look for the internal manifestations of scleroderma like interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension, which require studies like lung function with pulmonary function tests, like an echocardiogram. So I always wanna be anticipatory, not reactionary. I don't wanna to react to something. I wanna I want to prepare and try to make sure that we look for it ahead of time. So it's important what we call things. And then finally, mixed connective tissue disease, MCTD. I'm sure someone watching this has been given that diagnosis. What does that mean? That is associated by definition with an antibody called anti-RNP, You'll see on future slides, it has sometimes more letters before it, but RNP stands for ribonuclear protein, and that has features of scleroderma, lupus, and myositis, all or one or the other. So we need to be careful in watching for, um, watching for those overlap features there too. I'm gonna skip the antisynthetase syndrome for one minute because I'm gonna go to that in the next slide. Muscular dystrophy. The idea that more than children present with muscular dystrophy, which is not something I think I really appreciated in my early training. I somehow didn't realize adults get muscular dystrophy, which of course they do. 
It is not uncommon for them to mimic polymyositis. People get treated with immune suppressants sometimes for decades. I have seen that situation, unfortunately. When there's no response or minimal response, and there are other clinical features for which I don't have time to speak about today, but there are three really important ones that as rheumatologists taught by our neurology colleagues, well, thankfully, we think about slim girdle type 2B or dysphalinopathy, um, fasciocapulohumeral dystrophy, it's a mouthful, FSHD is a shortened term, and then something called myotonic dystrophy, usually something called DM2 or type 2 myotonic dystrophy. We're looking for characteristics in your EMG, in your clinical exam, something that doesn't make sense in the history to make sure we haven't missed an adult onset muscular dystrophy. And I just diagnosed one of these in the past six weeks. Um, antisynthetase syndrome without the rash of dermatomyositis. So the antisynthetase syndrome really is its own entity. Most people will just call it DM or PM, and you might have the other features, and you might have a JO1 antibody. And I, I don't know, it, it's not laziness. I guess it's just sort of easier to tell people you have polymyositis, you have dermatomyositis. But really, this syndrome is different. We believe it's different from a pathologic, from a genetic, from a lot of different ways um, than just typical, quote unquote, what we would call PM. What is the antisynthetase syndrome? It is a constellation of some or all of these. Most people don't express all six. Most people s express one or two of them, at least, um, and a specific antibody, which I'll show you. So this is the syndrome phenotype. I mean, this is what you look like clinically, but you have to have one of those antibodies, either JO1 or one of its cousins, and I'll show you what they are in a minute. The antisynthetase syndrome has not, usually non-erosive. Erosive means that you don't see erosions or the bone withered away on an x-ray, like you can see in typical rheumatoid arthritis. I used to say it's non-erosive. I think the better way to say this is usually non-erosive, but we look for erosions. It isn't a symmetric inflammatory arthritis that can look a heck of a lot like RA. As a matter of fact, about 40% of people with this syndrome often develop the arthritis first, and they're called rheumatoid arthritis. And then they develop some muscle involvement or roughening of their hands or something else on this screen, and people start scratching their heads saying, maybe that is an RA. So it's not uncommon to see the arthritis first. Next in line is fever, and fever is usually um, a diagnostic exclusion of infection or drug fever or something that's causing the fever that is n not an external source. That's coming from within. Finally, mechanic, or sorry, next, mechanics hands, and that's a roughening. Maybe you're looking at this lecture going, boy, I don't know why my fingers are so rough. If you're not a mechanic and you have no other reason to have roughening of your fingers that look callous like this, this is an immunologic phenomenon. It's tough to treat. It often persists even no matter what we give people, usually responsive to prednisone, but other other immune suppressants aren't great at taking care of this. We have no idea what causes this, but it's very helpful for us to put you in this category. PMSCL is another antibody that does cause this that is not on this slide, is not in this syndrome. But for the most part, when we see these, um, especially in the absence of a rash, we're, we're really thinking of the antisynthetase syndrome. Interstitial lung disease is the most important clinically in this syndrome in that we want to make sure that we carefully follow your pulmonary function test and a CAT scan if need be. Raynaud's phenomenon, this is a very severe version. I usually don't see fingers look this bad. Uh, they're usually more bluish, but in very severe cases, they're really, really, literally this white. This is probably somebody who just touched something cold or reached into a refrigerator. Or in other circumstances, emotional stress or liability, like emotional liability can cause these changes in the skin. And then finally, the myositis itself. So those in concert with the first box. So um, the blue box there is the antisynthetase syndrome, an unfortunate acronym, but that's what it is. Uh, and uh, so JO1 is the uh, typical prototypic autoantibody by far. That's probably one of the most common autoantibodies in myositis. It is one of the most common autoantibodies in myositis and certainly the most common antisynthetase autoantibody. PL7 and PL12, if you've heard of that as part of your diagnosis, that has a higher instance of lung disease, and we're very careful with those two antibodies to screen pretty systematically in the beginning, and then if, if the disease is stable, we don't do PFTs as often. But I scan, I, I usually screen with pulmonary function tests every three months, at least for the first year of the disease, to take a look at the cadence of the disease and how severe the lungs are infected. Some people don't have any affect of the lungs with those antibodies, but they're much more common to affect the lungs. Anti-EJ and OJ, next on the list, and then much less common, KS, HA, and ZO. I see these very, very seldom. They're extremely rare. 
As far as the overlap myositis, you've seen the RNP before. I told you there are more letters here, but suffice it to say that is the mixed connective tissue disease that we see. PMSCL is the scleroderma overlap. I didn't mention KU before, but I'll show it to you on a slide coming up next. That can be associated with anything. It can be associated with lung disease, it can be associated with lupus features, it can be associated with Raynaud's and other connective tissue disease features. It really doesn't have its own nice little box, but it certainly can be seen in myositis. And so a clue antibody just makes us think that there may be other systemic features we need to be wary of. Next down on the list is dermatomyositis, and I'm not going to talk about those antibodies today. NM or NAM, or I-N-M-N, -N, yet again, that's our necrotizing myopathy. We talked a lot about that, and those two antibodies that are known, there may be more, but the two we know of are SRP and HMGCR. SRP is a particularly um, difficult uh, myopathy, especially in, in younger women, for reasons unclear to us. Some people fare well, but it's a difficult myopathy to treat. They often have a fair amount of atrophy, where the other ones, other than IBM, other myositis syndromes do not. And HMGCR is seen more often with um, statins, but it can be seen in statin-naive patients as well. CN1A, or NT5, NT5C1A, is a um, antibody that is uh, seen with inclusion body myositis. It is also seen in dermatomyositis and Sjogren's, occasionally, rarely in lupus, but we are usually not trying to figure out the difference between those syndromes. So if we're looking at somebody who looks like they have IBM and we have this antibody, Usually, that's a, it's a good um, help for us to say, yeah, we think we're in the right diagnosis there. That tells us much more likely to be IBM. We don't fully know all of the reasons for that antibody. It may suggest that people are more clinically severe, but I will say that I see this in a large majority, a, a, a large number of my IBM patients, and I'm not sure that we know enough about what it portends. This is really just the, the end of the talk, looking at putting it all together what does myositis look like? It literally is exactly what I just showed you in that table format, but looking at all those little blue bubbles all together and those, those um, purple bubbles of, of inclusion body myositis, the blue bubbles of overlap, and the green bubbles of necrotizing myopathy. With good, validated, reproducible autoantibodies in a commercial setting, they can help us a lot determine what type of myositis you have. The reality is that they are not well standardized. We see a lot of false positives, unfortunately, where people are terrified they have something they don't. And um, we s carefully dissect it through and see if your clinical features match the antibody um, that you might have been told you have. Every once in a while, the antibody is early and you haven't developed the clinical features, but most of the time it's a false positive if there's nothing going for that clinically. Um, but in the right hands, in the right lab, when we get good information, these antibodies can be imperative in helping us figure out where you stand. Well, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of being at the Myositis Center with us at Johns Hopkins in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland, I am a proud Baltimore uh, resident for almost 20 years. I came here to do my fellowship in 2001 and never left. I thought that I would be here for two or three years and that was 20 years ago. Um, and right now, obviously, in the uh, unusual pandemic year, not so many people are making the trip to Baltimore. We're one wonderfully able and up to now myself, 32 states to do telemedicine consults, but we personally love to see you in, in person when we can. This is Johns Hopkins Bayview. You may be very familiar with Johns Hopkins and the Dome and the East Baltimore campus that you may have seen on some TV shows or maybe have seen in person yourself. This is the Bayview campus where our center is located and now for about 50% of our faculty, sometimes we go between both campuses like myself and others um, attending in both hospitals. This is the 301 building. This is the building where in the neurology suite, I'm not a neurologist, but I do uh, learn from my neurology colleagues. And as a rheumatologist and with other rheumatology colleagues of mine, it's a pleasure to work side by side in the space of the neurology suite. And then finally, I do not work in a vacuum. I could not do the work that I do every day without the partnership of the people you see on this slide. Other folks not featured on this slide are our fellow trainees, as well as our um, office staff, which is really the wind beneath our wings that keep everything going. Three wonderful women who you may have spoken to, uh, whoops, who, um, uh, who really keep uh, everything running smooth. 
this is our um, team of scientists and clinicians, including a concert of rheumatologists and neurologists. Maybe some of your doctors are on this slide. I always say that um, I would be proud to be anybody's patient on this slide. I don't want to be anyone's patient, but if I needed them, I would definitely be um, honored to have any of them care for me. I'm privileged to work with a multidisciplinary team of pulmonologists, neurologists, rheumatologists and physical medicine rehabilitation. We um, really are the dream team together and hoping that we make better um, progress and in inroads in treating uh, this disease. Finally, we are what's called a Precision Medicine Center of Excellence, which I'm very proud to have been designated at Hopkins, where we're trying to provide very precise, personalized medicine. This takes a lot of data points, it takes a lot of um, ingenuity, it takes sometimes computer programs and good statistics, and sometimes it really just takes a lot of time, samples, etc. But hoping that one day, instead of making decision trees based on experience, we make decision trees based on genetics and a whole bunch of other, um, and other input that helps us be more precise doctors. Well, it has been a pleasure to be with you today, and it is now time for the q and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure there are many, and I realize that this was a whirlwind tour through a very complex um, question that even doctors struggle with every day, so I'm sure it's a, it's, a, it's a bunch of information, but I hope you've learned something, and again, always a pleasure to be with you. I hope you're enjoying the conference, and for that, I will say thank you, and any questions? Be well. Thank you, Dr. Christopher Stein, for that informative session. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A within the video screen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear okay? I hope so. I, I know that you all can't speak, but I'm listening and watching in the chat. Um, a couple of things that have come up in the chat. Uh, let's see, I'll try to get through this. Um, some people would like me to speak about the current thought about IBM crossover with PM. You know, I, I think I, I, I alluded to this a bit when I spoke about, and, and if you ask, some people will say that's not true, that it's always been IBM and we misdiagnose it. I would have said that a few years ago, but I think as I've said, I do think there are there is a subset. It's small, but there are some patients that do not have the typical rash of dermatomyositis, under the microscope, there may be some early changes that may suggest IBM, but they're not, they're very subtle, and they're not there, or they're not there at all. And you mostly have lymphocytes, you have an, lymphocytes is the type of white blood cell that's the inflammation that we see. Um, and otherwise, really clinically, don't have finger flexor weakness, still have weak hip flexors. The interesting part of that is that usually the proximal muscle weakness, so our shoulder girdle, hip girdle, that actually often improves with immune suppression and steroids. But the distal strength, the, the inability to have a full grip, maybe foot drop. I didn't talk a lot about the feet, but in IBM, um, certainly many of you might wear uh, ankle foot orthotics because of the foot drop, those kind of things. Um, they are more prominent later in the disease, and they do not seem to respond to immune suppression. So I hope that covers it a bit. Um, we have thought, so MCTD with symptoms of lupus, I don't know if that, oh, that's actually just somebody answering, I think. Um, is anti-JO1 a definitive diagnosis of PM? That's a good question. So if you have a JO1 antibody, and let, you know, the other thing I didn't get to speak a lot to, which, uh, you know, is, a source of frustration. I think the good news is that autoantibodies are now more accessible than they ever were. Previously, they were mostly a research tool. No one has been available for a long time because it's done in a different uh, way. So Joe one is done by something called an ELISA, which is a way to do a test more rapidly where it doesn't take time to precipitate, uh, which can take actually a few weeks to get results back. Some of you may have seen that. If the JO1 result is believable and it looks consistent, you might have some of the other features. It's not definitive for polymyositis. That, again, that's to me, if you don't have a rash and you have JO1, I think you have the antisympathy syndrome without a rash, but many of your doctors will call it polymyositis. So you can call it polymyositis with JO1 antibodies for the antisympathy syndrome with out a rash. So I, you know, again, I think it's a semantics issue there, but Joe one is very helpful 
usually in telling us you don't have IBM if you trust the antibody. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, there. Hmm. Muscle biopsy was, I'm looking at the chat, I'm not sure how much is chatting to me and chatting to each other. So there are some people, somebody mentioned, you know, that they could have distal weakness. And again, this is a little bit of a nuance, but the type of distal weakness, uh, for example, um, like finger flexors, finger flexor weakness is pretty distinctive. I don't know that I can see too often finger flexor weakness, occasionally finger extensor weakness, and sometimes wrist actually can be involved. I've seen it in dermatomyositis. I've seen it occasionally in necrotizing myopathy. But the type of distal weakness that I was talking about with regard to finger flexor or foot drop, those are really distinctly much more unusual outside of IBM. So I thought hopefully that, that helps. Um, anti tif one gamma. Um, and if you have an anti tif one and it's real and you believe it, that actually goes along with dermatomyositis. So that is in that, you know, I showed you these you know, head spinning uh, classification with all of these antibodies, it's like alphabet soup. And I don't expect you to be an, expect you to be an expert after a lecture like this. I actually think most physicians don't, don't know all of these antibodies. This is m much newer, uh, uh, you know, nuances. So if a TIP1 gamma has come back, that's most, one of the most common antibodies that is associated on occasion more often with cancer than not. But I'll say this again, a TIP1 gamma antibody I have more often seen no cancer than cancer. It's a, just a very common antibody. But if you're older and you have that antibody and you seem to have dermatomyositis, we are a little bit closer watching for cancer, especially in the first three years of the disease. But I don't want that to terrify anybody if you have that type, if you have that antibody. So if I've received a CN1A positive test result, but my clinical features included rash and doesn't point to IBM, should I still be investigated? This is a great question. So when we looked at CN1A and or NT5C1A, it's the same test, and I showed that to you. While that's very helpful to discern the difference between PM, whatever we're calling that, and, and IBM, we did see that in dermatomyositis. So if you have the typical rash of dermatomyositis and have that antibody, I mean, I don't even know how to put that on that slide, but it is seen, it's seen occasionally in Sjogren's, and it's seen occasionally in... Um, uh, in dermatomyositis. So absolutely, that's, you shouldn't question your diagnosis unless you have atypical features. I do have one patient, I should just saw, who uh, has dermatomyositis IBM overlap, without a doubt. And she's got both features on biopsy and both features clinically. Again, these are entirely the exception and not the rule. It's not impossible to have an overlap with PM. Okay, let's see. Am I taking new patients? Our center is taking new patients. I'm a little bit slow to um, uh, see newer patients because my colleagues have more availability. But as I said before, and it's true, I actually even ask medical questions to my colleagues I've trained. You cannot go wrong, in my opinion, seeing any of my colleagues. I'll especially speak for the uh, rheumatologist I have trained, who I am partial to. But please call our center for, um, for new patients. You can Google it on the web, just to Johns Hopkins Myositis Center, and it says how to make an appointment. You uh, obviously we're in a little bit of a virtual world, but we are seeing new patients in person and virtually. Um, and so now because of the wonders of telemedicine, I've been able to meet incredible people across 33 states now in the United States. Um, there are 17 states for which I do not have reciprocity. Unfortunately, California being one of them, call your Senator and tell them that that's your um, Let's see. Uh, oh. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm getting a note that I should click on Q&A. Okay, I think I've got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, what's next? Can patients have PM and DM? No, you can't have PM and DM. You have one or the other. If you have a rash and it's appropriate rash, you have DM. Um, can you have IBM and PM or DM? We spoke to that. The answer is yes, but in very rare situations. That's something if you're really having that question, you can get a second opinion or ask closely that that if you are somebody who is like, I don't meet any of these criteria very well. And there are people I'm sure who patients of mine who I first met them and, and told them they have features seemingly of all three and eventually they, they differentiate it into IBM. But it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell in the beginning of your diagnosis. Some neurologists don't consider IBM an autoimmune disease. What about me? Oh boy. So never pit me against my neurology colleagues. I, you know, I, I have a, it's, as you saw, right, I have an associate professor of neurology. I'm not a trained neurologist, but I have a joint appointment because I'm privileged to uh, be able to do so much neurology work. 
So I might say that I am probably more influenced by the neurologists I work with, who I believe probably do believe it's an autoimmune disease. You know, I, I think this is such an intriguing question. The reason that people say this probably can't be autoimmune is that seemingly every immune suppressant we try does not have a vigorous response, right? Occasionally, IVIG is a not an immune suppressant. It is a um, immune modulator. And I have heard, and many of us have tried IVIG in a typical IBM phenotype, and you have that rare person that says, look, I know I'm better. We measure strength dyna with a dynamometer, which is a quantitative strength measurer. You have to be careful that either steroids or IVIG or what you're taking is actually making you better and not just making you feel better. So the idea of how, um, whether IBM is autoimmune, I think people feel it is not, a lot of neurologists struggle with the, the autoimmune diagnosis because no immune suppressant really seems to have a has, a, has a ballpark hit and run, it treats it. It is neurodegenerative in that it, you know, it has features by no means is the same by any means as of ALS, but there are under the microscope some uniting features and ALS is a neurodegenerative disease. And again, I wanna be very clear that these are entirely different diagnoses, but they may have fine similarities and that may be coming from, um, you know, from some of the pathologic things that we see or genetic. Um, so it might be both. Uh, if uh, you've ever heard Steve Greenberg speak, who uh, is up in Boston and is the guru of all things IBM, I think it's his opinion that we just haven't hit the right immune suppressant yet, that it's probably able to be suppressed. We just haven't hit the right pathway. And then we see these autoantibodies, right? So that CN1A says, well, we're making antibodies. Is that what we call an epiphenomenon where you make them, but they're not really part of the disease. They're not pathogenic. They don't cause or contribute to the disease. We don't know. So I would say that it's probably both, but I understand why some neurologists are confused. Okay, let's see. What's next? Uh, do you have to go off medication prior to visiting your clinic for a second opinion? Oh, absolutely not. Don't do that. Um, I love when people um, show up without having been treated because, boy, that's a lot easier in general to try to, to dissect what really did help. Like I was saying before, when you have to be, when you're wondering whether you're really a medication failure, and again, you might have just not tried it long enough or not tried the right one. And what is the right one? It's so variable. I think that I, what I spoke to at the end of my talk, this idea of a, a precision medicine, right now we have a lot of expertise. We say, okay, this is probably going to work for you or this isn't going to work for you. And then we're surprised when it does or doesn't work. So I would say that um, with regard to medication, that's obviously much more in the IBM. I haven't found a uh, hit it out of the park IBM medication, um, except in those people that have some overlapping features. For the most part, um, uh, uh, medications in general in IBM do not seem to help. We often take people off them, not to be confusing, but I have at least maybe three, four instances now where I told my patients that I've met to stop there. For example, I can think of Michael Phenolate, which is branded as Celsept. Michael Phenolate in at least two different patients, three different patients, I stopped it and their swallowing got worse. And it was absolutely very, very objectively different, even with swallowing testing. So, you know, I'm mean, not saying that one size fits all. And I don't think that while, while we usually recommend not using immune suppressants in IBM, like I said, I think this is an evolving field. And there may be some of you who are listening to me right now who might have a bit of an overlap. And it's not dogma that we just stop. Whereas before I would have said, yep, you, have to just, you should just get off all of your meds. They're more harmful than helpful. I think that's generally true in IBM, but not always. So I hope that, hope that makes sense. Um, does microscopic colitis go with all types of autoimmune myositis or mostly DM? You know, I, uh, that's a great question. I think it's probably in all, I haven't seen it as much with IBM. I see it a lot in DM. So much so that I always said I was going to write this up in the medical literature and someone beat me to it. So it's not just me that has seen this. I have several patients with microscopic colitis. What is that? That is... Uh, a microscopic diagnosis, exactly what it says. When the gastroenterologist goes in and does a colonoscopy and looks at your bowel, it looks relatively normal. There's not a lot of inflammation. But if you do blind biopsy, it doesn't mean they're blind doing them. It means they're, they're seeing parts. They're, they're biopsying parts of the colon that are not affected. Those, um, those biopsies can show microscopic areas of inflammation. And that often responds to a steroid called budesonide. It frequently doesn't respond to prednisone as well. 
a different type of steroid, yet one uh, the bowel is a better has better responsivity to to budesonide. Uh, Again, this is not a talk about microsco microscopic colitis, sometimes called lymphocytic colitis, but I see it enough that patients that have persistent diarrhea, I ask them to get scoped and have their gastroenterologist take, um, take biopsies of the colon and look for that entity called lymphocytic or microscopic colitis. It is probably seen across the board. I'm trying to think clearly, I do at least have one person with IBM that has microscopic colitis, so it's not zero, but much more likely with CM. Okay, let's see, what's next? Um, I have Joe one and I have PM. I also have Raynaud's mechanics hands arthritis. Do I also have DM? No, you have the antisynthetase syndrome. So I think that's a perfect, this is to Cindy's question. Cindy, I think it's a perfect uh, example of you've probably been called PM. I mean, just because it's easier to tell you that you say you have the antisynthetase syndrome and you're like, what in the world is that? I try to tell my patients these diagnoses uh, recognizing that you'll even see the way I code it as polymyositis because insurers and other people don't understand those diagnoses as well. So PM is like a blanket term. And I would say what you have is the antisynthetase syndrome without a rash, which is also often lumped into PM. Oh, I hope that makes sense. If not, you can chat and tell me if I didn't answer it. Um, why can't you ask, answer questions? That I don't know, Arlene. I'm sorry. That That might be one for the host, maybe, I don't know, um, Aisha or LaDonna, if anybody can help Arlene, she's trying to type a question. Um, are elevated lymphocytes associated with a particular type of myositis? Um, elevated white blood cell count can be in the beginning of, for t I can think of at least a few instances of the antisynthetase syndrome, but lymphocytes themselves, it's actually, I think in my experience, it was more often the neutrophil, which is a white blood cell as well, but it's a different type than the lymphocytes. Um, so not, it's not a diagnostic criteria. It, if you, um, yeah, and even prednisone would increase the, the neutrophils or those called the PMNs, polymorphonuclear cells, uh, not lymphocytes. So I'm not exactly sure what that would be coming from. Can you become antibody positive by being on IVIG and getting other people's antibodies? The answer to that is, Yes, but you're not actually positive. That's a passive transfer. I don't think I've seen a single case of passively transferred of these, of the autoantibodies. You do occasionally, the most common antibody transferred with IVIG are the hepatitis antibodies. And it's, it doesn't give you clinical hepatitis. You don't have hepatitis at all. You have the uh, resolved antibodies from somebody who did have hepatitis and all, all you do is get the antibodies. But the actual antibodies that I talked about, those autoantibodies, do not, as far as I know, passively transfer. I have not seen any examples of that, to be honest. It's a great question, but I don't think it's that. But you definitely can get other people's antibodies. You can get leukemia antibodies. Again, don't get leukemia. You just get an antibody to um, something called HTLV. Or, uh, uh, again, very, very rare. anti coup weak positive ILD IBM overlap. Possible. So anti-Ku, I think I told you, boy, Ku is a really weird antibody that I don't really know what we do with. Um, it, it usually is associated with ILD. And I have seen, you know, to Brian's question, I have seen Ku plus ILD plus IBM-E looking things. It's possible that you have an IBM um, overlap with the Ku antibody. I definitely think that's true. And when you have other autoantibodies and some IBM features, I think again, without not evaluating you personally, I think that you and others that have that story are likely to be in that weird overlap. And why that matters is you may, may respond to, to immune suppression, at least from the proximal muscle or the ILD standpoint, for sure. ILD or interstitial lung disease is not generally a feature of IBM. It just is not. Um, I'm brilliant. Thank you, Alexis. <laughs> My fan club is here. Um, I appreciate it. And I know I'm a fast talker, so thank you. Um, if I've been diagnosed with PM via muscle biopsy and the medical regimen is helping with my symptoms and the CK, is there a reason for me to look more into whether PM is the right diagnosis? If I should be looking, what should I be looking for? So all antibodies were negative. So Rebecca, that's a great question. I think, you know, um, if all antibodies were negative, and I don't know what you're on, but if you are responding to immune suppression, the one caveat I would say is it sounds like you're helping your symptoms. That's the number one thing. Let me just um, 
And as, as an aside here, many of you who have probably heard me speak at TMA before or on the web or wherever, I think the most uh, important caveat to using prednisone, not immune suppression, but uh, prednisone is immune suppressant, but prednisone in particular will often lower the CK. It lowers muscle enzymes. It does that in muscular dystrophy. It does that across a cohort of patients with various diseases, including myositis, and it doesn't always help the patient. So the one thing, I think it helps the doctor. So the problem, I, when I first um, started working, when we co-founded our center, one of the stories that was so um, jarring to me is patients would come in and they'd say, look, my numbers are better. My CK is going down. And my doctor says I'm improving, but I'm getting weaker. And I was like, why does the doctor say you're improving? They said, because the number's going down. So if your number's going down and you're not getting better, it's probably not the med. Uh, and you know it's a medication related thing. The other reason that CK can go down and you can get weaker is that you lose muscle mass, but that is a long, long process. That's not a short term thing. So I guess the short answer to your question, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I would say for sure, if you're responding to therapy and your symptoms are getting better, by all means, I would certainly not, not change your charted course. Um, you may want to see um, if you're not already at an academic center, to go to an academic center like ours. I know Rohit Agarwal spoke before me at Pittsburgh. Some great academic centers may be where you live when the pandemic allows better travel. Try to see if you have um, autoantibodies that we can often see in our own lab. We sometimes look for antibodies. Often those antibodies necessarily are not clinically available to you, but it can tell us to test again, to look in a clinical lab. So if something's not quite right, Antibody negative polymyositis, I don't know what that is. You know, there are people that have very much look like polymyositis, don't have an antibody. That may be, you know, the, the true polymyositis where we just haven't discovered the antibody yet. I hope that's, that's a very long answer. Um, next one, have I seen patients originally diagnosed, how do you, or is that chronic fatigue syndrome? I'm not sure what those other acronyms are even are, eventually receive a myositis diagnosis. Oh my gosh, yes, I've seen them with everything. Now, I'm not sure. You might have to type out for me what SEID is, but I'm sure CFS might be chronic fatigue. Um, do you use the symptoms of post-exertional malaise in myositis patients? So, or exer I guess post-exercise, how frequently do you see normal CK levels in myositis patients? There's a lot to unpack there. I've seen patients with every possible diagnosis. The first two patients I saw with myositis, one was told they were overweight, one was told they were depressed. Um, so, you know, I've seen everything, especially in women. Uh, people get told all kinds of things that they don't have uh, or, you know, there are other things. So I think until you've had a very adequate workup, do I see, I've seen every diagnosis and said to be something else. But, um, I think post-exertional malaise, I don't know if you mean uh, like exercise or exertion, that's a hard symptom. Do we see it? Yes, yeah, definitely yes. So people will say, that, but that doesn't make the, that's not a criteria for me, but do people get, very tired or have malaise after exercise or sometimes feel worse the second day after they finally have enough energy to walk around a mall or do something? Absolutely. Patients of mine tell me that they can often do something for one day, but the next day they're wiped out. So that's very common. Normal CK, while we're trying to diagnose a myopathy, in dermatomyositis, I absolutely see it. And that's a whole other lecture. But dermatomyositis can have a normal CK. The other myopathies like IBM, it can be IBM is usually just slightly abnormal. It's usually not thousands, but a couple of my patients, maybe you're watching, you know, your CK is 2000 and you have IBM. That always is a trigger to me to think that that's something else, but yet I, I, I don't know. I don't know why. Most IBM cases are just slightly above normal in the labs or twice normal. Necrotizing myopathy, by definition, when that's diagnosed, often they're in the thousands. So your CK, normal CK in most labs is under 250. The average CK of people that I diagnose is five, six, seven thousand with necrotizing myopathy. And then these overlaps, you can have um, a slightly elevated CK, but if you're truly having muscle involvement and it's not dermatomyositis, your CK really should be abnormal. Unless it's treated, of course. Um, I just see cell set methotrexate platform. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to address any of those. Any of those, they all are used to, to treat um, inflammatory myopathy for sure. Um, what percentage of Joe patients get ILD? I think the medical literature says that at least one third and some say more, but at least 33%. And that actually, the newer literature may have it a little bit higher. So when I have a patient with Joe 1, I screen with pulmonary function tests every three months for the first year. 
and if they were completely fine and your initial CAT scan is okay, I do not keep CAT scanning you. I did when I started practice, I definitely did. I did CAT scans every year in the beginning, then realized that the radiation exposure did not seem to give me any more information than a pulmonary function test. So the only reason I would re-CT your lungs is that if your pulmonary function test continued to drop, and I don't know why. Um, but I use PFTs or pulmonary function testing to um, manage this disease. And that has been one heck of a challenge in the COVID era. I know my colleague, Dr. Agarwal, just spoke about COVID. Uh, and boy, trying to get any aerosolizing procedure has been a bit of a bear, but we are um, hopefully now on, um, on uh, a better track and trajectory to be able to protect you. Just one quick uh, public service announcement. This chat is great. I'm gonna to try to hopefully, I know I have a few more minutes. I'm gonna to try to answer them all. One PSA, I will say, I saw that 40% of Americans reported that they did not seek care during the pandemic or they held off care. Some of which I know was beyond your control. As those of us, we all shut down the world and some of you couldn't get to us. We tried our best uh, and we're closed ourselves. I will say that as things gradually reopen and all of us wonder about a, you know, a second larger wave during the fall, we'll see. Um, I will say that I, I feel confident that in every hospital system that I have been able to access so far, that a hospital is actually one of the safest places. My neighbor said, should I get a colonoscopy? I said, I think it's more dangerous for you going to the grocery store than going to get your colonoscopy. Maybe not quite. But, you know, everything has its risk. But I more trust the people in the hospital than I do maybe at the grocery store down the street to use universal precautions and keep you safe. So the pulmonary function is now opened again. And it, actually, to be honest, the risk is probably more to the staff than it is to you. I think that we're doing a great job. So please get your PFTs if you're able to. Um, yes, ponder the steroid question uh, for sure there. Uh, thank you for saying these nice things to me. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm not currently, but I did get a second opinion. Dr. Amato. So Dr. Amato um, is, uh, Steve Greenberg is one of his partners, and uh, Tony Amato is a giant in the field of, of uh, myositis, and he would not mind me telling this. Well, it's recorded, right? I could tell you in public. He and I have had spirited discussions, we'll call them, sometimes arguments, uh, in good ways, uh, about the way to take care of patients or what these diseases are, and I think it just shows you that art is a science, is, is, is an, I'm sorry, medicine is an art as much as it is a science. I respect that Tony Amato tremendously, although I would say that Anybody, and I think that myself, and patients have gotten second opinions who have seen me, you darn well should. You should never, ever feel like you should not be able to get a second, third, or fourth opinion if you really want one. Um, I might stop after the, the third because probably, hopefully you've gotten the right diagnosis. Um, okay. Oh, thank you for paying out a pod guy. I feel terrible, but thank you for doing that. Yes, CFS, chronic fatigue. Um, I've been checking Q&A, uh, I hope. I'm, I'm, it's, it's the Zoom webinar chat. I hope that's the Q&A, let me see. Hold on. Um, oh, okay, I see it. Is it possible that there is a disease spectrum range for PM, IBM? Yes, definitely, that's what I spoke to. There's a continuum in some people. My weakness is both proximal and distal. I have, I have DM. Yes, some people with DM do have distal weakness, especially if you have the NXP2 antibody. That's common, uh, not common, that's reported and seen. What's the latest thought about IBM crossover? I think I, cross, I think you meant with PM. I think that, I just answered that. Um, yeah, if the distal weakness is your forearms, weakened forearms and grip, I would think about, um, I would definitely think about uh, IBM. Some people have finger flexor weakness in DM. That is very rare. I, um, you also know it's possible that your tendons are affected and that's a whole other story. Um, uh, and yes, so you can have a tenosynovitis or a tendonitis that's affecting your finger flexors for a different reason. Um, no meds for the last four years. Congratulations to you, Diane. In the past two years, I was diagnosed with Raynaud's and it's getting worse. Raynaud's is associated with dermatomyositis. And so for Diane, you may be in fact get, having a recrudescence of that. And I would definitely ask your doctor about that. Um, IBIG we answered. Uh, yep, so I think I'm doing it in both. Let's see. How can we trust that we are diagnosed, I think correctly, well, that's a that's a symbiotic relationship with your doctor. I think you have to trust them, and um, you know, if not, get a second opinion. I would say. Um, okay. um, Johns Hopkins is not affiliated with the NIH, but Dr. Mammon, Andy Mammon, who is my partner who started the clinic, now works at the NIH, and so we work closely. And there are clinical trials going on at the NIH to which we refer our own patients. Um, 
We hear a lot about mitochondrial malfunction and autoimmune disease. Is this an issue in IBM? It sure is. There is definitely mitochondrial um, issues. I haven't spoken about clinical trials or our small clinical trial that we did with pioglitazone. One of the thoughts was that we could alter mitochondrial um, function by doing that. We hear a lot about CBD. I watch the CBD lecture because every patient asks me about CBD and I feel it's my duty to be educated. Are there studies of CBD and IBM? Not yet, but I hope to do them. We just did, maybe some of you may have gotten this survey where we're trying to understand patients and physicians' attitudes. You're not surprised to hear that doctors are scared to talk anything about CBD and cannabis uh, a lot of the time. Not every doctor, but medical professionals are a little scared to do that. Um, okay. I, what role does neurology have in DM? It depends on the types of neurology. Neurology and rheumatology, we work in concert together. Neurologists often do the diagnostic work and rheumatologists do immunosuppressive work, but many neurologists give immunosuppressants. Um, if you have a negative blood test for IBM, most, many do. So not everybody has that antibody. I wanna be clear that the CN1, CN1A antibody, if you don't have it, you most certainly could have IBM. Um, we think it might be less severe, that the antibody might be associated with a more severe type of IBM, but that's not clear. We always have studies underway at Hopkins, and we do right now actually have that, but not for IBM right now, but that's coming down the pike, and Tom Lloyd runs most of those, and I am involved with some of them. Can you have no hand weakness in IBM? You bet. Some people do not have that weakness in the beginning, and it comes a little bit later. So it is possible that you've not experienced hand weakness yet. I think I can, I, I have to go, <laughs> it's 2.15. Um, it says it's been helpful and gosh, I, let's see, no one in my family has autoimmunity, just about everyone has muscle stiffness. That's somebody I think you should, might want to talk to a, about a hereditary syndrome and maybe get genetic testing, definitely. Um, let's see, by the way, most people don't have myositis in families. It doesn't run in families unless you have hereditary IBM, which is quite rare, it's usually sporadic. I, I spoke about the sporadic form. I think I mentioned her, hereditary IBM is not part of this lecture day. It's an entirely different diagnosis. Um, muscle biopsy with white blood cells. I suffer from muscle pain and wasting. Uh, my treatment's methotrexate. CK is normal. Hard to know, Arlene, without actually seeing you there. It sounds like you have features of IBM, but might be difficult. Um, I like that you liked my spirited discussions. That's what you should call arguing. It looks good when you say that. Uh, do we offer initial remote consultations? We do, it's hard. I will say trying to do an exam. I had a patient's husband the other day trying to do a reflex exam for me. Uh, all things challenging in telemedicine world, but I think it's often very helpful. What I love telemedicine for is to do the initial consultation, get a feel for what's going on, review your records, look at you, and then say, okay, when it's safe or if it's safe for you to travel, let's see you in person to find those fine features or could you tell your doctor locally to do X, Y, and Z for me? So yes, I definitely think we can do that for you. Um, and I think that is it. I got to maybe 98% of your questions. If not, I'm sorry, I tried. I'm, I'm a fast talker, but maybe not so fast of a reader, but I think my the cane, the hook is gonna come and take me off the stage here, the virtual stage any minute. Thanks for spending the afternoon on, on a beautiful, at least in Baltimore, a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I couldn't be more happy to be here, and um, I will continue to dedicate my time and my life to making things better for all of you. So enjoy the rest of the conference, and thanks to the conference organizers that I am in awe of how you've done, try to bring this all together in a way we've never done before. Stay well, stay mass, and do the right thing. Bye, all.